Jolie. Oh, yeah. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 33 of the Sailor Jerry podcast. My name is Matt Cothran. I am still your host. Today is April 7th, 2022. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, in case you were wondering, Sailor Jerry Spice Drum is still made the old school way, 92 proof, bold and smooth as hell. Man, oh man, I missed you guys last week. Gotta say rest in peace to Taylor Hawkins, uh, amazing individual, uh, all my love to the Foo Fighters camp. Um, you know, all my love to everybody out there while we're at it, you know, because life is crazy sometimes. And, um, you know, I'm just thankful for every second uh, that I get. So much love to everybody out there. Uh, make sure that you pass it on. You know what I'm talking about? All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for episode 33. Yeti Bones is one half of the industrial hip-hop duo, Horror. In this episode, we take a look into the crystal ball of Yeti's life and times. From growing up on 90s rap classics on the hard streets of Newark, New Jersey, to discovering punk rock in a warehouse in Brooklyn, and finally, moving out west to pursue the life of a musical madman. Plus, we get the full scoop on the band's latest album, Skin, produced by the one and only Travis Barker. It is an awesome record. Yeti Bones is an awesome dude. So sit back, relax, pour yourself some Sailor Jerry, and let's go. good man <laughs> good. i was just watching the fucking uh the kanye easy video i was just saw it on my phone people are losing their minds over that shit the pete davidson fucking yo, buried alive <laughs> no I, I ain't peeped that yet i, <laughs> Dude, I, I ain't keep it yet but I, i've been seeing like tweets about it i gotta check it out yeah it's it's pretty amazing man i don't know if you've been watching the uh the kanye netflix netflix thing but it's been pretty fucking dope uh to take a look back at, at everything he's done so now you get like a good mix of like old kanye and current yeah, kanye, yeah, current yo, kanye. The, thing, the thing is yo i'm a kanye i'm a kanye fan i'm a kanye stan like since day one like i've been keeping up with those documentaries and um yo before Kanye blew up, I had those like I'm good mixtapes. Like I had, I was listening to the the version of Through the Wire where his mouth was wired shut. Like I was putting my homies up on this new shit. I was like, yo, you heard of this dude called Kanye Through the Wire? Like this shit is fire. And I remember like all the hoopla of him being a producer. And it's like, yo, the producer trying to rap. And, you know, I was young, so I was just, like, open to anything. But I remember him spit on Rockefeller had this uh, album they did. It was just, like, all those Philly cats, like, State Property, Benny Siegel, and Petey Crack and all of them. And um, there was a song called We Are the Champions, and it was the first tune. And Kanye, I think Kanye did the beat, but Kanye was the first verse. And I was like, yo, he actually dope. And from then on, I was like, I'm following him. And then the shit just obviously blew, blew up. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. The, the documentary is really good, dude, because it's like, uh, it's funny you mentioned PD Crack too, because there's there's a whole moment where Rockefeller like kind of like signs him like just to keep him on as a producer, you know what I mean? And he's yep. under this, he's like, he wants to break out as a rap artist so bad. And they just like won't 
acknowledge him at all, at, like at, at all. all. At and all. they have it all, they have it all on video too. And it's like, it's pretty amazing. Cause he'll like, he's in rooms and he goes to the, he goes to the offices and he's rapping yeah. for everybody. And dude, they're just like, whatever, man. Like <laughs> yeah. the fucking grind is so crazy. You know how crazy, like, like, I would never go in the room and play a beat and, and be like, yo, let me spit this. Like that shit is like crazy, but just how hungry, how hungry he was to like do that and be like, yo, I just, I ain't just a producer. Like I, I spit too, like, like fuck with this shit. Like it's, it's dope. Cause you know, everything he was saying, it's like, he kind of just brung into light and, you know, and I kind of, I feel him on like shit he was doing as an up and coming artist trying to get on. Like, that shit is like my spirit animal. Like I, I feel him 100% on all them things he was doing. I'm just like, damn, yo, this is just like us. Like fool's trying to, like he was saying the dude was trying to uh, get his beat for free. And he was like, yo, <laughs> just cause I go in a store that fucking sell TVs and I watch TV, I'm going to get the TV for free. But you know, it is what it is. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. And it's cool to see like all the old school footage of him, like with all of his gear and like the hotel room and shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I love that shit, man. It's fucking dope. And like yeah. one last thing on it was, uh, I forgot how fucking tight he was with his mom, dude. And Yo. it's like, dude, dude, oh my God. Like she's so amazing in that shit, man. And when you see like how crazy it must've been when she just died like that, it was just like, it's gotta oh, be dude. so crazy. Like, I, it's so sad. Like it, I was just talking to my bandmate earlier about it. I'm just like, even thinking about it, I'm just like, fuck, because I'm a mama's boy. You know what I'm saying? Like same, I, same. I got my pops and my moms around, but I'm a mama's boy to the fullest, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. All right. So let's dive into horror. Let's dive into your life. Where did you grow up? East Coast, dude, right? East Coast, Newark, New Jersey. Oh, oh, dude. If you know about Newark, dude, dude. you know how it is you know what i'm saying like i grew up in nork in the 90s and uh, oh. it was um it made my it made my skin tougher hell yeah to be honest you know how some people be like yo i had a traumatic childhood like i did as a as a young black kid growing up in nork and parents not having no money and you living in the hood you know, if you're in the mind of a young black child in an urban community, it's way different than somebody else living in Wisconsin in the suburbs or something. You know, it's just the way you grew up. And uh, yo, North was fucking crazy. It was so crazy. My younger childhood memories, like I remember cars screeching down the down the block. Like it like Nork was like the capital for Grand Theft Auto. It was fucking wild. Like. I remember my mom's being caught in a a, a drive by once. Yo, it was, it's just wild shit, like wild shit. Yeah, but Nork Nork in the nineties was was real. Like I remember being a kid and seeing Red Man, um, drive by, in the in the fucking Red Beamer, and I thought that shit was so tight, man. I remember seeing Naughty by Nature. Uh, I seen Queen <laughs> the T on the block, like you know, like Nork was. North, North, New Jersey, you know, New Jersey Drive. Like, I don't know if you've seen that movie, New Jersey Drive, but it's a good, it's a good description. One of those, it's like Minister Society. It's like one of those hood movies, but it's based like in North and they just stealing cars and wilding and shit. Oh, but, hell yeah. Yeah. I got to check that out there. Cause I dude, I know, I mean, you know, I'm West Coast born and raised and, you know, I, I know through traveling and through, I mean, dude, Newark is one of the hardest places on the planet dude bro nork is hard and <laughs> has some history with like riots and shit and you know nork is you know nork is like the wild wild west and that's one that's where i'm from and i later moved to union county and then i was in south jersey before i moved to la but nork is like nork is what made me you know yeah no for sure for sure when did you get into music as a kid were you listening to like what your parents were listening to or, or did you kind of like what what kind of music were you listening to growing up so you know my parents old school old school black folks you know what i'm saying and my my pops was my mom wasn't a music head like that but my pops was super music head you know he come from the doo-wop era so you know and um his thing was groups he liked groups 
And it's crazy because I recently asked my father, I was like, yo, why are you not into like James Brown or Stevie Wonder or like, um, you know, like certain singular people? And uh, he was like, his era was all about the groups, the doo-wop, the harmony, yeah. the bass, the tenor. So, you know, he would be playing like Temptations, uh, the, um, Smokey, just all the Motown stuff. So yeah. I really got equipped to that young, but you know, you growing up in the hood, you're going to go to school, you got friends, you're going to find out about new stuff. And uh, the internet was not really a thing when I started listening to music. And uh, the first cassette tape I had was Bone Thugs and Harmony. Oh, hell first yeah. First album that e Eternal 99, because, uh, the thing is, when I was young, I used to go to my grandmother's house. She lived on the first floor, and I used to watch. I don't know if you remember this thing called the box. What was the box? The box. It's like it's like MTV Jam. They just play videos twenty four seven. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I will watch like I will watch like uh, fucking um, DMX videos, Bone Thugs. And in between these, this was the era of like corn and system of a down and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm waiting for this like DMX Rough Riders video to come on. And I see this corn video come on and I'm like, yeah, this shit kind of weird, but I'm kind of <laughs> into it. But I don't want to let my friends at school know because I'm just like, yeah, it might be embarrassing. But hip hop and rap was like the main thing growing up. You know what I'm saying? Like. The yeah, the Bone Thugs was my first cassette tape because I was so in love with the song um The Crossroads. Hell yeah. Like that was my shit. I was like, uh, whatever this was, <clears throat> I was like, this shit is dope. And uh I don't know if you remember, but back in the days with cassette tapes or or CDs too, you could buy the single or you could buy the whole album. And oh, yeah. it was like the single A and B side single instrumental. Yep. Yep. And um, I was like, mom, I like, I need this. You know, my mom's is open. She's like, okay, I got you. And uh, she made a mistake and bought the whole album. And I don't know if you're familiar with that Bone Thugs first album, but that yeah. shit is like the hip hop version of Slayer. It's like bad <laughs> satanic. They talking to Ouija boards. They talking about <laughs> killing, robbing fools, sticking fools up, like all this like crazy shit. And um. I remember riding in the car with my mom's and she pressed play on her first song. And this shit sounded so demonic. And my mom's was like, <laughs> what the fuck is that? And I was just like, ah, yeah, that shit sounds cool to me. This and ain't I, Crossroads. It wasn't Crossroads. Crossroads was like seven songs then. And the first songs was just like some flat out like gangster horrorcore shit. And I fucking love that shit. And um, yeah, I remember after that, I bought Busta Rhymes, Extinction, Extinction Love, no, 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 When Disaster Strikes album. Yeah. And that shit had mad curses in it, parental advisory sticker. That's when that thing was like, this is clean and this is the one with curses. And my mom's pops bought the curses one and they actually tried to hide that from me. And I found <laughs> it. And I started listening to it again. And my pops was not really about it. But my mom's was like, yo, he going to go to school. He going to hear it somewhere. He going to grow up. So you might as well just let him listen to it. And uh, after that, I was full in. I was like a music head. Like I was just attracted to music. And then when that DMX, It's Dark and Hell is Hot came out. Oh, yeah. It's a game changer. I was like, yo, this like, yo, when I was a kid, I looked at DMX as fucking God. Like, I remember, like, getting the Rough Riders bandana and putting it to the side so the R can hang off. And, you know, like, mind you, I'm living in the hood. I'm living in Newark, New Jersey. This was around the time it was, the, like, a lot of drugs being sold outside, um, fucking stolen cars. Like, I'm in this environment. Yeah. And uh, DMX was just hard and, you know. I think Eminem had came out around the time and all like all my black friends well, I only had black friends at the time, but everybody was like, yo, this white boy could spit. Like <laughs> that shit was dope. And uh 50 cent first album. And you know, that, that was the upbringing. And 
I used to, it was mixtapes was a thing back then too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like heavy mixtapes. Like I was big on like all the, the dipset mixtapes, the locks mixtapes. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Smack DVD, like rap battles. Like when I was young growing up in North, that was that was it. Like I, I fucked with that. Like I really I like I was prone to my parents' music, but that it ain't really hit me until later in life where I, you know, I I can appreciate like black music and black culture coming from that era, you know, of like, you know, jazz and funk and blues and all that. But hip hop was the thing. And I had like so many CDs, so many, many tapes, fucking Jay-Z, Wu-Tang. I remember buying Ja Rule's first album. That shit was fire. And, uh, you know, just that era. So that's what that's what I was listening to at a younger age. Yeah. You know, that's a that's a golden era of hip hop, dude. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of great eras in hip hop, obviously. But I mean, the records you're talking about, I mean, those are all time classics, you know, like I remember uh, the Bones, th the Bone Thugs record when that came out. It was like, a, you know, it was like a it was like a, a double strike for easy because easy just come out with one eight seven. And it was like his first record back. And like, he was talking mad shit on everybody. And then, <laughs> and then, and then he had fucking bone thugs in his back pocket too. Cause yep. he, he would, you know, he brought those guys up. So yep. that was like a crazy time. Cause it was like the, I, I remember that in my head as like, that was a huge reemergence for easy, you know? Cause he, yeah. he was like, he was back and he was spitting like crazy shit. So yeah. that was dope. And you know, 50s first record is insane. You know, that shit, I, I that shit was like spread like wildfire. Yeah. And I, I love I love Buster, dude. I love the fact that still to this day, like no one wants to battle rap Buster. Buster, Buster, Bro, <laughs> Buster got so many pockets yeah. and flows and, and, and hits and, and like he got joints from 98. He got joints from 2005 and he got joints recently. Like, yo, Buster is legendary. I remember being a kid. Extinction level event album had came out. And, and this one artist was still doing like in-store signings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Buster came to Newark. He came to the record store and I got to meet him and take a picture. And I got a mental fucking like memory of what the picture looks like, but my fucking mom's lost that fucking picture. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, mom. Like, I, I had a pic with young Buster with the dreads, like skinny, oh. like, like woo-ha Buster. And uh, yeah, that shit, I remember that memory. And I remember walking outside and seeing Split Star and be like, yo, and he was like, he was mad cool, but yo, Buster was that dude, you know? But those yeah, albums for sure. are essential, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and and especially like, I, I, I totally understand like the, like the DMX vibe as far as it hitting like extra hard growing up in Newark hard. and just being in that environment. Cause that hard. was like, that he created like a, a subculture in hip hop that like, I think everyone was like a little bit jealous of, you know what I mean? Like it was so dope when it came out, you know, it was like, it was fucking insane. It was, it was hard. It was, the songs were fucking incredible. The beats were sick. The videos, I mean, you know, he's introducing Eve, he's got rough riders going. Hard. I mean, that, that era was hard. undeniable, undeniable. Hard. For, for me, for my age, to, DMX is, my generation's Tupac. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because Tupac was a little early for me. And, you know, I knew about him, but I wasn't, like, really hooked in knowing what was going on. It's the same with Biggie, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, I fuck with Biggie. Like, Biggie's crazy. But there was a little bit ahead of me in the 90s before I latched on to music. But DMX really spoke to me and you know people across the world in that sense of, of of Tupac you know he was hard he was spiritual he was a man of God his his lyrics was not holding back at all he was talking some real gutter gully hood shit and you know he was like he was like a shaman you know he was like a real person of, of you know his life was crazy and um DMX was like, you know, he was like the holy grail for me growing up. Like, you know, and them albums came out back to back. It's dark as hell is hot and my and flesh of my flesh, blood of my yeah, blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I was like, yo, this is, yeah, those albums is. Yeah, and then, and then fucking Belly comes out with Nas. That movie was such a fucking game changer, dude. Oh, 
Dude, that movie, oh. honestly, I, I like saw that movie like early on and I was like, oh man, it like it I, like it's still one of my favorite movies. It's so fucking good. Yo, Belly <laughs> is like Belly is one of my top movies, you know. What I'm saying? You know <laughs> yo, the, the crazy thing is when that came out, the scene where Method Man is in a strip club. Oh, dude, yeah. That's the drug dude, and they start bucking at him, and he gets shot out the um uh, out the, the fucking um the glass door. Yeah. That strip club is in Irvington, New Jersey, down the street from where I, where I lived. And I remember my mom used to drive by it all the time. And I'd be like, that's, that's the, the spot. That <laughs> method man got blasted out of. But uh, yo, Belly was Belly was sick. Hype Williams. Yeah, man. Yeah. And it's uh and I feel you on Tupac too, because he's probably my favorite MC, I think. But I was so late on him, man. Like I dude, I'll never forget. I used to work uh at this fucking sporting goods store in Downey, California, this place called Big Five Sporting Goods. And uh-huh. I worked there and I was like a young kid. And there was this dude, uh, Mexican guy who was this awesome friend of mine. And he was diehard Tupac, dude, like <laughs> diehard, diehard. Yeah. And he, he would come into work every day, just rapping. And he'd be like, dude, like, you don't even know what this guy, he was all into the conspiracies and what this was. And this is, you know, before he passed and all this stuff. Yeah. And he would, he was just telling me over and every day, every single time I saw this guy, he was like, dude, Tupac is the greatest of all time. He would just be, and it was like, and it, I never got it, dude. And years yeah. later, I finally get it. And now you can look back on this catalog and just be like, oh my God. The thing like, about what the, what dude, the lyrically, fuck? what he was writing at, and, and how young he was, it's just like, Jesus Christ, dude, it's mind crazy. Blown. Mind blown. Mind blown. <laughs> um, if you haven't checked out, for anybody that hasn't checked out, there's a Tupac exhibition going on at LA Live right now. I don't know how long it's up for, but it's been up for a while. But I went to it a few days ago and that shit blew my mind. It's a lot of information and process, but Tupac was real, real, yeah. like yeah. A, a real, real one for how young he was. Like imagine Tupac, his late 20s, 30s, uh, early 30s. Like, I'm just like, damn, now all that shit he was saying and spitting and talking about. He was like 23, 24. Yeah, it's super crazy to like think about like people being that prolific at at that age. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 such like a there's a reason why artists like that are, you know, very few and far between and and oftentimes like, you know, generational, you know, just because they're just they're so rare that all those things happen. You know, the talent, the fucking, you know, the, the ability to connect and perform and write. Yep. And, you yep. know, like it's, it's just, it's crazy. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll have to go check that out. Cause that seems like it could be cool. I saw cool. Uh, recently you saw, you went to the Geiger museum, right? Was that recent or was that some old shit? Um, that was recent. It was a few months ago, maybe like okay. three, like three months ago. Yeah. I went to, um, I went to Switzerland and check that out. And then I went to Belgium to, um, to get tattooed, get my neck tattooed. And, um, I've been I've been a fan of Giga for a while and I'm I've always told myself like yo when we get back on tour if I got a day off or some time in between I need to check out that that Giga museum and um yeah I made a plan and set it and I'm like yo I'm doing this shit and uh it was <laughs> it was a uh it was a lot to take in man um it was a lot to take in first of all just getting there was kind of crazy you got to take like four trains because the shit is like in the middle of nowhere and then once you get there you know it's basically like farmland it's like a town and farmland once you get there you got to walk another like 20 30 minutes uphill and the museum is on this little land and it looks like a fucking castle like some lord of the ring shit but it's a little town up there and um yeah I went and I was like, I was like, whoa, this shit is like, I don't know, you get it's a it's a vibe in there, you can feel it. And funny thing, I I before I got in, dude's checking my ID and uh, he looks at my ID and he's like, Are you the guy from horror? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? I'm like <laughs> Yeah, he was like, yeah, I seen you guys in Switzerland years ago. And I was just oh, like, oh, hell yeah. 
I'm like, yo, I'm in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I'm in the middle of nowhere, and this dude just recognized me, and he gave me a free. He let me in for free, and I was like, sick. But uh, that's fucking yeah, dope. Yeah, the museum is dope. If you ever get a chance, you in Switzerland, you got to check it out. Is yeah, his. I can't even explain it. It's just like so far past the human thinking. I'm like, what was this dude's brain compiling in his head? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's it's super. He's he's a super special artist, and I've always wanted to check that museum out. Hopefully, one of these days, uh, I'll, I'll get the opportunity to do so. But I saw you were there, and I was like, ah, oh, shit, man, I gotta ask him about that. Yeah, um, all right, back to Newark now. Back to Newark. So you know, you're you're listening to all these amazing records. Uh, music is is digging itself deep uh, inside you. Before you meet the OGM, are you looking to you know are you doing anything musically are you writing are you performing or or you know when did when did that happen bro the the, the crazy thing growing up i never wanted to do music or write music or perform music i was just a fan of listening to music yeah and before i met the ogm i was just going to shows in new york and just wow the fuck out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The younger me, the, the 19, uh, 20 year old me. Um, what did I start? I started, so this is around the time like um, fucking like MySpace was a thing. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we're, in, we're in the MySpace era. My, yeah. MySpace. And I'm at the end of high school, going into college. And, you know, my style is starting to change. Yeah. I'm starting to go from baggy. And then I don't know if you remember, there's this one, there's this era of hip hop where everybody wanted to be a fucking rock star. <laughs> everybody wanted to fucking have the boot cut jeans, the wallet chain, the, the belt. All the black kids in my high school was going to Hot Topic. Or uh, other kids were starting to wear like uh, vape and uh, ice cream. And I didn't have yeah. enough money for that shit. But I was transitioning from like baggy clothes. And then I was in this like uh, like retro kid era. There was there was an era in the early 2000s where cats was in New York. And they was wearing like, you know, all these neon bright colors. They had the high tops. And it was the thing. And it was yeah. tight. I was like an era. But I was trying to find my my myself my style my my comfort zone and um the thing is i started going to new york and i started going to sh going shopping with a few friends in my high school that was putting me on and within that there was streetwear brands like supreme a life um stussy um just within that era so i'm going to new york and I'm seeing all these different cultures and people. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's kind of fucking me up mentally because I'm just like, damn, nobody in New Jersey is doing this or damn near knows about it. Like everybody in New Jersey is still like 10 steps behind wearing throwback jerseys and and Jabot jeans and, and Timbs. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm kind of like progressing in this new world of, of style and fashion. But I came upon this uh, streetwear brand called Alien. It was from New York and their style was just fucking sick. And this is the time too. Where I'm starting, my jeans are starting to get a little bit tighter. Yeah. You know I'm saying I'm liking the skinny yeah. jeans and um, <laughs> yo, these cats was tight and they was just a crew in New York and all their fits was tight. They made dope clothes, images and me young looking at all this on MySpace. I'm like, Whoa, this shit is cool. So they would throw like events you know, they would have little pop-up shops where they do clothes and then they throw like maybe a little after party. And uh, they threw an event and I told my homie that was a close friend from home and he was kind of like a, he was, you know, he was kind of in the bubble of me too. He was like a skater kid. Like, you know, we talked about like Wu-Tang, uh, Rage Against the Machine. He, he was wearing skinnies too. So me and him, we rolled over. <laughs> and at this time, I think I was dressing like I was fresh out of like, urban outfitters like I, my style, I was like it was a little weird i had like white vans all over print shirt i think i had a i had a high top 
I had a high top like two pocket juice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I was on that tip, and um, they they threw a, they threw an after party, and there was this group called Ninja Sonic, and another rapper by the name of Theophilus London that was playing a show, and I remember going to the show, and it was it was in a DIY spot. And, you know, everybody was walking around with 40s, people in there smoking. And I'm just like, I'm like, whoa, everybody's dressed all cool. You know, people, I'm young, older people there. And I'm just like, whoa, this shit is, this shit is tight. And I had found out about everything on MySpace. And I was checking out Ninja Sonic. I was checking out Theophilus London. And I was like, yo, this shit is tight. I feel like this is like an underground thing I'm going to. And me and my homies just tripping. We in there sober as fuck. Just like, yeah. So later on, the, the shit got shut down and nobody performs. And I'm like, fuck, man, that, that group Ninja Sonic was really like, I, their shit looks crazy on the internet. Like I'm trying to go. So I went to another Ninja Sonic show with the same friend and um, it was even in a more grimier spot. And this is in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It was at yeah. a, a warehouse called The Shank. <laughs> <laughs> Shank. The fucking the shit was grimy as fuck. But um, it was Ninja Sonic and maybe a few other like, um, you know, I don't want to say punk bands. I don't, I'm, I'm looking for a right word for it. I don't know. It's like this era of just like. Williamsburg hipsterish kind of yeah kind of shit yeah going yeah on, you know and it was like 2009 yeah so, at that time Williamsburg had its own sound pretty much yeah it had its own <laughs> thing and I was just getting acclimated to it you know and that was my first time kind of stepping out in New York by myself and I remember getting off the train at Williamsburg and I'm just like am I are we in the fucking hood like it looked a little grimy then we got on Bedford Ave and I was like <laughs> seeing dudes in fucking flannels and, and, and i was like all right we're, we're good we're good and uh, i remember going to the show and the show was crazy and this is this is the turning point they did a cover of bad brains attitude and when they did that cover the whole place turned into a fucking tornado yeah people was falling on top of each other picking each other up it, it was just insane. And I was on the outskirts of it, just looking like, looking and smiling. I'm like, what the fuck is like, what is happening in front of my face? That point right there, that shit blew me away. I was like, whoa, what the fuck is this? So later I went home and mind you, I've never really been to live shows or no, I'm, I'm young. Yeah, I didn't know you could cover a band song. I didn't know other people can do your song and, and it's, it's called a cover. So I went home YouTubing Ninja Sonic Attitude and Bad Brains popped up. Bad Brains at CBGB's. And at first I was like, I was like, yo, what? I'm like, I was confused. I'm like, wait, they're taking their song? And, I'm like, and then it hit me. I'm like, oh, this is this is the band and they did their song. And I watched that whole CBGB's video of Bad Brains. And that was the point. That was literally the moment I was like, I was like, black dudes, dreads, reggae, punk. <laughs> what the fuck is this shit? I was like, what? I was literally like, what the fuck is this shit? You know what I'm saying? Like, imagine going from, Jay-Z and Wu-Tang, and then you come, you stumble across your hard stumble. I'm tripping. I'm tripping over this shit. I come across this, and I'm just like, what the fuck is this shit? And right there, it just clicked. And from there on, Black Flag, Minor Threat, Misfits, GBH. It just, yeah. I was like, this, this is it. This is, this is my calling. And even at that point, I didn't want to do music. I was just, I just wanted to go to shows and fucking rage. Yeah. I yeah, man. to go to shows and fucking let loose. I wanted to let fucking loose, but that, that was, that was, that was the fucking turning point. And that led me on to all the other punk shit. And uh, yeah, that, that was. That's dope, man. That's that another, uh, another creative 
doorway opened by the mighty bad brains, man. It's like, I can't, there's so many uh, artists, so many musicians that that was like a, a gateway band for them. Um, I mean, even, you know, bands like Minor Threat, bands like yeah. that, that, you know, it was like all based on just how insanely good and original and just, you know, badass the bad brains were, man. It's like, well, it changed my life. It literally yeah. changed my life. Like it, who I am now is because of them and then my journey from them on then on is just uprising and uplifting but that was the changer like I, I really don't know what I would be doing or how of a person I would be if bad brains ain't I didn't stump, stumble upon them yeah man yeah absolutely shout out to bad brains for sure oh. um so when uh, you're going to shows now 2009 2010 when does uh when does the OGM come into the picture? So so the, the thing is, me and the OGM had mutual friends and from my high school. Okay. And that mutual friend lived in the same town as him, and that was the dude taking me to New York and showing me all the dope shopping spots. Yeah. Because the OGM, I don't know if you the OGM got style too. Yeah. He, he been he been looking like. Steezy, and mind you, he looking like that in the era where if you wearing tight pants or anything bright colors, you getting called gay, you getting called weird, you yeah. getting shunned out from your own people. So he been doing that, and that other dude that was the mutual friend, he was his style was crazy too. He was wearing like vape, and he 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 had a, a mohawk riding a skateboard through the hood. Everybody looking at him like. <laughs> Who is this dude? You know what I'm saying? And I remember we had each other on MySpace for a while. You know what I'm saying? And then he worked in the mall. He worked at a store called Journeys. And oh, yeah. You know, was, I remember being in a mall with my homie, you know, just walking through window shopping, looking, looking to talk to girls, just trying to look cute in the fucking mall. And uh, yo, I stumbled upon him, Journeys, and I was like, oh, shit. I was like, you the OGM. And from then on, you know, it was like all love. And then we started going to like events together. We start kicking it. We started going to show, shows in New York. And we really became like, it was like a tight bond. And I, yeah, I wasn't even, I think I was like 20. I was like 19. You know, but uh, yeah. that's, how, that's how I that's how I met him. We had we got mutual friends. Hell yeah, and he's Jersey too, right? Jersey, yep, Jersey. He's in Linden. That's okay. uh, that's uh, Union County, so that's like like fifteen minutes from Newark. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And was he doing music at that time? He was starting to do music. Yeah, he was doing music, but it was more so of a a, a rap approach. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, um, just you know. Just talking about what he going through his lives. I don't want to say backpacker rap, but you know, just you know, just he was rapping. <laughs> he was yeah. rapping, and yeah. uh, it wasn't until I like started bringing him to shows and showing him like all the punk stuff. I'm like, yo, you got to check this shit out, man. Like this shit is, this shit is fucking crazy. And then he got accustomed to like the more aggressive and just the different genres and experimental stuff but yeah like he was you know i had to bless him with my knowledge and what i was seeing in front of me and i was like yo you gotta come to these shows man these shits is crazy yeah so you got i mean you got coming up on hip-hop you got watching the box and sliding in corn system of a down nope. you got you got you know popping off in brooklyn you got discovering punk rock you got me and the OGM. You guys get tight. Tell me about the first single, how it came together. Because I want to know how, like, the creative collaboration between you guys, how did it happen? So the thing is, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm like, I'm an illustrator. I know how to draw. I know how to, yeah. I know how to paint. I've been drawing since I was young. And um, the OGM was doing, like, an experimental rap kind of project. And he asked me to do the artwork for it. And in due time, he was like, yo, you should like, you should like be like, talk shit in between songs, like do skits. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. okay, 
I can, yeah. I, can, I can do some skits, you know what I'm saying? Or some like ludicrous type shit. <laughs> and then, um, that went from, he was like, yo, I'm like, yo, you should let me like be on a chorus. Like, let me, let me yell. Let me be the punk part and you can do the verses, you know? And that went from like, yo, I got this beat. I think you should try to rap on it. And mind you, I'm not a musician. Yeah. I never rapped. I never wrote. I never even thought about rapping. I know other people's raps. I know Mob Deep raps. I know Wu-Tang. I know Jizza. I don't know my own shit. But at that point, yeah, we, we was calling ourselves the Dead Idols. And yeah, I think we had Google other bands or Google that and like other bands came up and we was like, nah, we got to get off that. So Bone Collector, the MP3 was actually called Horror. The MP3 was called Horror. And then I'm just like, whoa. I'm like, yo, we should do the Horror and flip it. Because at the time, Odd Future had came out and everybody was just on this whole 666 wave. Like it was just yeah, like- Yeah, I remember that. It was crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like the Odd yeah. Future coming out, it was, that shit spread so crazy. And everybody was just like 666, like everybody was trying to be cool with it. Not saying them, because they, they owned up to- what they had going on at that moment was fucking crazy, but just the, the reaction and, and everybody at like 666 was the thing. Yeah. And I'm just like, yo, we got, we got to be different. We got to, we got to stand out. We got to stylize our shit. So we, we did the horror and we just flipped the R's to the nines. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And mind you, I'm not thinking in the future of how big or whatever the band is going to take off to be, but at that moment, that's what it was. And we stuck to it. And uh, so Bone Collector, which was called Horror, um, he told me to, you know, write some shit. And I wrote, I wrote to it. And I was so afraid of my voice. Because, you know, you hear your voice for the first time, and, you know, you're like, what the fuck? Like, even if we did this, even if I never did an interview and we did this interview and it came out and I heard my voice, I'd be like, damn, I sound like that. <laughs> so I was I was like bugging. I'm like, yo, y'all gotta fucking you gotta tone my voice down. You gotta like drop that shit like chopped and screwed. And if we go back to the song, that's why it's deep because I wasn't comfortable with my voice. Yeah. And we made a video for it. The homie, one of the homies from the hood shot it. And yeah, I like directed that shit on my own. I was I remember going to his house like every other day editing that shit. And I'm like, yeah, you know, we need to be fucking popping drugs. We need to be burying the body. It needs to be crazy live show shit. Like this shit got a hit. You know what I'm saying? And that was the first tune that we like, oh, I think we got something yeah. going on here. You know what I'm saying? And from that point, I became more comfortable. And then I think we, from there, we made like the blue nigga from Hellboy, the Casey Jones. And then it started it started you know becoming a thing yeah that's dope man and it, it, were you so you got kind of comfortable to it relatively quickly then because like almost like one two tracks in you were like okay this feels oh. good this you know what i mean this is dope because yeah. a lot of people can sit on that ledge for a while you know what i mean like before they're comfortable with their voice or before they're like you know confident in their art you know what i mean but it seems like you know you guys once you kind of just once you guys kicked it off you were you were guns blazing you know what i mean because you guys have been fucking dude i was like looking through all your shit man you guys have been busy you've been putting out shit steady since 2014 yeah. i mean fucking since 2013 really non-stop dude so yeah. at what point uh is there a certain release for you where you feel like you know you like really kind of came into your own mm. there's a few there's a few answers to that yeah a so few answers to that well you know the, the performance part you know mind you I'm, I'm coming off this this wave of punk yeah. so i'm looking at punk as in oh it should be done like this you know what i'm saying i used to drink i used to pregame i used to have fun i used to just i'm young dumb and blind just fucking doing whatever and um yeah when we first started <clears throat> i was like sloppy 
<laughs> Poppy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, 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 I do. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> like sloppy, just all over the place. Because, you know, I'm watching all these minor threat vids, black flag vids. I remember like watching Gigi Allen vids too early because yeah. I was just like, whoa, what the fuck is this? Now, you know, that's <laughs> like another monster, but I was just sloppy. I remember watching these uh vids on like um the decline of Western civilization with yeah, the term. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, that shit was giving me inspo. I'm like, is it done like this? I think so. And um, you know, when we first started, you know, I was drinking and it, it was just done like that, but years later when things got serious and more so, you know, like, Oh shit, this is life. And basically when we moved to LA, yeah, I was like, this is serious. This, this thing is like, I need to take this serious. Cause I'm going to be doing it for a long time. And I don't want to go back to New Jersey. I don't want to go back. To that. <laughs> I, was like, I don't want to go back to that job that I didn't like that. I was working every fucking day, busting my ass, coming home tired and not wanting to go out and do what the fuck I want to do. Yeah. So when we moved to LA, I was just like, all right, this is, this is a serious thing. I need to make sure my performance, right. I need to make sure my life is right. I need to make sure I'm right. And the people around me, right. So from that point on, it was like, okay, I got this shit. Like, you know, and, um, yeah, that was it. Pet peeve too. While we talk about performance wise, me and the, me and the OG of pet peeve all the time is when we see rappers or anybody, but it's mostly rappers with a backing track, and the shit is like karaoke. Yeah, we fucking we fucking cringe so hard at that shit. I'm just like, dude, dog. it's why it's wild how lazy some some artists can be with their performances nowadays, dude, because yeah. like they're literally and it's all types. It's not just rappers. It's it's pop, you know, pop musicians, people, like anybody. But mm -hmm. it's like, dude, they'll have the whole motherfucking track plan and they'll just come in on like one or two words. Bro, bro. <laughs> like, come on, because like a little bit more. Just give me a little bit more. <laughs> yo, that shit, yo, you don't know how bad I look at that shit. And I'm like, what the Fuck. That's why we put so much pride and effort into our live show and performance. Cause I want people to leave and be like, this shit changed my life. This shit made me a better person. This shit opened my eyes up to new music, more doors. This shit gave me inspiration to want to make music myself. Never in my life, never as long as this band has been, we've never used the backing track. Every word, you got to spit that shit. You got to spit it. You got to mean it. You got to say it. You got to have some grit. So that's why we take performance just so, we, we take it so serious. You know what I'm saying? And through the ages of me progressing with knowledge and doing certain things and other certain bands that give me inspiration, I'm just like, this is, we got we to gotta make it. You got to walk away with your mind blown and face fucking melted you know what i'm saying yeah for sure and and every every band every artist is different but i feel like it takes it takes everybody a little bit of time to figure it out and i think yeah. there's a common thing in 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 the punk rock world uh you know with singers with with front men and front women where yeah. it's like whether wherever there's a confidence issue it's it's the the, the the or or like an experience issue it it just equates to you know, go fucking crazy, you know, because you've seen decline of Western civilization. You've seen the bad brains, you've seen all these bands. So if you don't really know what you're doing, just act a fool and you know, it'll, it'll be a good place to start, you know, but eventually like you're saying, you fall in love with the art, you fall in love with what you're doing and you realize, okay, if this is going to last, if it's going to be a profession, if it's going to be something that I do for the rest of my life, like I want to, I got to get real about it and I got to step into it, you know? So it's, uh, it's cool to see that you had that moment as well. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's all about progression too. You know, like when I first started listening to that kind of music, I just listened to punk. And then later I found out about all these subgenres: metal, new yeah. metal, death metal, death core, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, the fucking post-punk. <laughs> Um, you know, all the goth shit, 
um, extreme metal, crust metal, like it's so much types of music. And uh, even with that, everybody evolves and grows from the sound that they first started. Like I remember when we first started, we didn't we didn't want to sing. We didn't we we just we didn't want to hit notes or try things different. And as through time and we progress and, and our we become more in tune to music, we like, yo, we can it's okay to sing on this hook. It's okay to put this background vocal here. And you know, even with the more music I listen to, I'm just like, yo, we can change it up. You know, like we're the type of band, we're not pigeonholed in, in one kind of thing. It, it, it's just an element combination of, of different sounds. It's very experimental because our inspiration breathes from everywhere from punk to metal to rap to uh, death metal to jazz to blues you know to soul to funk it's a lot of elements yeah. we just grab all these things so that's why we you know that's what makes us who we are yeah absolutely man i mean you guys definitely have uh, a distinct original sound man i mean it's 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 really cool and one of the things i wanted to ask you about uh in like the early days of the writing process was um you know lyrically speaking you know how do you guys approach that between uh like does does one person do most of the writing do you guys each write your own parts and when you have uh you know a lot of stuff that you guys do is is kind of politically charged which you know comes from you know a lot of the punk rock background and and yeah. just honestly it, not even punk rock but just the modern era you know there's just so much yeah. shit going on in the fucking world right now um so like you know when you guys are collaborating on a song when you're writing together um, how does that play out? You know what I mean? I mean, we both write our different, we both write our shit. Cool. You know what I'm saying? I don't think it's been a time that we've like got anybody to write for us, but, uh, yeah, the early days was just, you know, mind you, I'm, I'm just becoming a writer. I, I need, you know, I want to express myself to where I can really pinpoint and people can understand me. When I first started writing, though, I was so engulfed in like horror. Like, <laughs> you know, because I was listening to Odd Future too around the time. And I was so engulfed in like, like apart from the band being called horror, like I really fuck with horror shit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my lyrics was just too crazy. It was too fucking crazy. And I was like, this shit is not going to fly in a long time <laughs> so i remember scrapping all the previous shit and uh you know mind you i got homies around helping me too giving me little pointers because you know the ogm he'd been doing it and we got other friends around being like yo you know you could mix this with this and this and that and you just got to be at a point where you hear an instrumental or a riff or a beat and the first once you got the first line down it's just it's just it just goes. And uh, yeah, that first album, the United States of Horror, you know, we were just speaking what was on our mind, you know, as like two young black men living and growing up in America, you know, the OGM's Haitian. His parents came over here as immigrants and learned the way of America. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, if they could do it, you know, you definitely make your way and have a life in America. And uh, yeah, we was just expressing what was coming from our heart and gut, you know what I'm saying? More so humanitarian state instead of politics, because, you know, I'm, I'm not a politician. I, I hate that shit. I don't even, every time I see something on a, my fucking Twitter feed, I'm just like, my brain is about to fall out. I fucking hate politics, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's the worst. And that that's, that's a, that's a good distinction, uh, humanitarian versus, you know, politically charged stuff, because that makes a lot more sense. I understand that, you know. Um, and then, you know, when that album does come out, United States of Horror 2017, that was a that was a big moment for you guys, you know, because you guys have been steadily building up. I think people were really ready for that, you know, that full length to drop. And that's about I think I saw you guys first like a year or two before that, I thought I first saw you guys at Ready and the Leads. I think that was like 2015 or 16. Oh, or yeah, like yeah. That. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I caught you guys and I was super stoked to see it. 
um because I'd, I'd heard a bunch about you guys and you know it was really fucking cool to actually see in person and uh you know reading the leads obviously a, an awesome festival over yeah. in the uk so as the band is growing and progressing and you guys are touring now you're playing festivals overseas you're mm -hmm. doing all this stuff the full length drops where are you guys at now uh, it come around united states of horror like what's the vibe in the band at that time is it like okay the sky's the limit we're going all out with this yeah i mean you know it's our first album it's our first yeah. official album it's our first time dealing with like a label in a company. We wasn't really signed to a label. It was a distribution deal um, out of Caroline. And, um, you know, first time, it's, it, it was just our first time. Yeah. It was just, you know, parents. That's a, that's a crazy time, dude. That's a, that's a crazy time. There's so, especially like touring, you have all the energy around the record. Yeah. Like that's a special moment, you know? Yeah, just, you know, like your parents just sending you off to school. So I feel like <laughs> USH was a, a learning point. It, it was a learning curve on, you know, dealing with label shit, prepping an album. Yeah. Pouring. It was just like, okay, this is how it works. Next time around, we're going to do it like this. And we're not going to go to this person or we're going to do this. You know, I think that USH was just a learning curve and, and our real first album. You know, I feel like since then, we've come into our own being better in the studio better writing better songs finding our our vocals how we want to say things you know because i think early on we was just like a band known for just being live like you got to see them live but you know in in this music game you got to have the tunes yeah Everything resonates from the music like all them all these artists we just said now I can be like, this is the tune I fuck with, or this is the tune that's like, this shit hits. You gotta have that that song, or the tunes gotta move you, you know. So I think we've become better at that, you know, but like our recordings, because the OGM, he fucking, I think it's like a few songs that he actually still likes, but everything else, he we listen back and we like, damn, we sound like that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You know, you fucking, we look back and we like, man, I don't even want to play. Like we sound like that. So I think that's a good progression with us now is that we found, we were, we found our thing. Yeah. That's always a trip between like the artist journey and like the journey as a fan. Right. Cause I think a lot of times like fans, they love to hold on to the early stuff and, you know, artists in a lot of ways, they appreciate that. But a lot of times the early stuff is stuff that just has been, you know, it's, it's special because you've been holding on to it for your whole life. So once you get it out on record, it's like, it, it's such a, like a, an exorcism of, of like, you know, creative energy that it's the first time you've ever done that. So it's special, but a lot of times, almost nine times out of 10, it's not your best work. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> you yeah, know, exactly. you know, and, and the second, the second, the second record's out or the second you have like a little bit of space from the first record to look back at it, you're kind of like, woo, you know, I, man, we're, we're, thank God we're a lot better now or whatever, yep, you know, like, yep, exactly. like with, with the Bronx stuff is, you know, it's like a lot of the people, they always look back at the first record. They look, they, mm -hmm. lucky for us, they appreciate them all, but it's, there's so many bands that it's just like that for fans, you know, they just don't, it's just it just is what it is but as an artist it's so it's so funny to like you could because of course i'm sure you look back and you appreciate the record but yep. you're like you're like man like like you're saying we just mm -hmm. kind of had to get that out of our system mm -hmm. and move and move forward you know yep. <clears throat> and so mm -hmm. and, and and you guys like as you move forward one of the things that i think is so cool about you guys and that you nail uh, about the kind of modern, uh, you know, digital era of music is the visual aspect of everything. Um, you know, you guys have a visual side to almost everything you release, you know, mm -hmm. and it, the stuff you put out, I know you work with Tyler Bradbury a lot. He's a fucking cool dude. Yeah, you know, he like you, he, he mentioned you. Well, I, I, yo, I'm actually going to his house after this, but I was like, yo, I'm doing this shit with the homie from the Bronx. And he was like, yo, I know that dude, he's mad cool, but that's our dude, you know? Yeah, yeah, he's great, man. And I so I wanted to, to rap with you about that just because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the visual aspect of, of, of art and especially of music nowadays is so important, you know? So how do you guys, 
have you guys always been into that? You know, coming from your illustrator background, you know? It, for, yes. It's <laughs> like, the, like the music, the live show, and your visuals, your presentation, you know, your livelihood, this is your image. This is, this is art. It has to be all high and on the same level. So when we do videos, whether it's pictures, a trailer, this shit has to engulf you in it. Like, whoa, what is this? It has to be better than the other person's. You know what I'm saying? Like, I look at other bands and artists as friendly competition. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, damn, they shit is dope. Our shit got to be doper. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just got to be on them high levels, you know? Going back to, like, Kanye. Anytime you put out something, it's just like, whoa what the fuck this is like next level like one of my favorite kanye albums is the yeezus just because yeah. it's so industrial and uh i remember seeing uh, i'm smashing myself in the head i didn't go to that that tour but uh that yeezus tour oh with, dude me too the one with the four he was on the fucking hover thing yeah dude dude i had so many friends going to that and i was like dude i gotta go i gotta go it looks so sick and i fucking blew it i didn't go bro i'm <laughs> just like shit like that i'm just like what the fuck like i want to get to the level where the creativeness can just go above and beyond and say like a band like uh ramstein yeah i don't know how old those dudes are but when I get that old, I want to be doing shit like that. Like, that shit is dope. And I've never seen them live. I've just seen videos, and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm looking at the videos like, yo, what the fuck? But, you know, just the creative process and visuals, and even with stage production, you know, as you, you know, can get a little bit more, we want that to be visually pleasing. Like, you know, the live show is already dope, but we really want you to leave and be like, whoa, this shit is the fucking... This should change my life. So yeah, with visuals and videos, I'm super hands-on. Like I'll be at Tyler's house sitting next to him being like, no, this right here. I think this, blah, blah, blah. Like I look at all the notes in the videos. Like he just sends me raw footage and I'll be like, okay, this part, I like this part, I like this part. Like I'm super hands-on instead of being like, yo, here's a director, here's my idea cook up a treatment and we'll shoot it i'm like nah man because that shit might fucking that shit might bail and it don't look good i hate i would hate to put out i would hate to make a video for a lot of money and then you watch it and you're like fuck this is not it yeah and we've done that before no so have we. <laughs> we've done, yo we've done that like three or four times we've had a video made by somebody and the outcome is something that we don't like and you're like, I just can't put it out. The moment in your head, if you look at something and you're like, ah, it's not working, you cannot change my mind to make that shit work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's happened before. And it's okay. I don't care if the fucking video is fucking G's. It's not going to come out unless we like it. So all the creativeness comes from us. <laughs> yeah, man, that's super cool. And it's like, I think you guys do a really good job of, of elevating the music. You know what I mean? It's like, and that's what like the visual aspect is, is there for it, but it's like, it lives on its own kind of as a, as a, like a, a, a creative piece, you know, it's like, it's just really cool. Everything you guys have done so far uh, visually, you know, to accompany the music. And it's rad because I don't think a lot of people understand, you know, how much extra work that is for one, you know, and like, you know, you, you have to find like the right, you know, kind of collaborator and person who gets the music, who gets what you guys are doing and is cool exactly. with you given, you know, hey, this is the direction I want to do. This is it. Because, you know, it's like it's almost like an extension of the band. You know, I mean, it is an extension of the band. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, I need somebody that knows like I could talk to that that knows where my brain is going and, and cool shit and references. And I just need somebody that's, that's down. And, you know, Tyler's been holding us down for a while. You know what I'm saying? T Tyler, Tyler is like, Tyler's like, is like what Cootie was to Kanye. You know what I'm saying? Like he's the man, he's the man. So 
Yeah, man. Right on. And then, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the mixtapes and collaborations that you guys got going on, because kind of taking it into, uh, you know, to the, to the modern era and to now, um, you know, you had the Blur mixtape, you had Turf Talk, uh, you know, Turf Talk had uh, Pussy Ride on it, Mind Your Business. That's yep. a fucking badass yep. fucking song. Great video, too. You, you know, man. sick fucking song. And then, uh, you know, one of the things that you guys just released, uh, Nudge Schneid, Backward Shug Knight. Uh, and then um, what was the Battery Not Included? That's what it was. Yeah. So yeah. those two, uh, that's the latest stuff, right? Yes. And yeah. that was, and Battery Not Included is fucking, I mean, both tracks are dope, but Battery Not Included is fucking badass, man. That's oh, a fucking good, you. that's a good thank song. You. I wanted to ask you about uh, working with Travis Barker because he's been doing so much producing lately. And a lot of the stuff, you know, has been more on the pop side. And it's kind of like people have been like, eh, you know, it's, it's cool. He's doing this thing. <laughs> no, but like, it's cool. You know, it's like, I, dude, I don't give a fuck. It's like Travis is, is dope, dude. He can do whatever he wants. It's music. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things that I noticed with, with this song, and it feels like with you guys, his style like fits perfectly. Yeah. Like his, his like badass style. You know what I mean? Like yeah. his, his, his real shit. Like yeah. fits really good yeah. with those tracks. So I was just curious what working with him, you know, what it's been like. So this is the thing. Like early 2019, I started noticing on socials that he was wearing our merch. Yeah. People was tagging us in his post. And then he followed us on Twitter and Instagram, but he, he was wearing our shirt. He's wearing our shorts. And to be fully honest, I'm not a fan of pop punk. I'm not a fan of Blake 182. I'm not a fan of that era of music or that genre. Because like we said, I'm a young black kid growing up in the 90s. So when other kids was listening to that, I was listening to DMX because that fit well with me that related to me that was what was going on around me so i wasn't introduced to that kind of music and when i was introduced to more aggressive music it was bad brains yeah and then i listened black i listened back to like pop punk and i'm like it shit's nah. not, it's not <laughs> hitting it's not hitting you know what i'm saying to keep it g to keep it 100 that shit is not hitting for me so seeing travis barker follows follow us on on socials we was kind of just brushing it off like, all right, cool, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, other people with blue checks is following us. We're not, we not jumping to nobody. Yeah. So a mutual friend, a good friend, hit us up and was like, yo, I talked to Barker. Like, yo, he's trying to, he's trying to get up with y'all, trying to see what's up. You know, we was kind of on our own, our own wave. And, you know, we kind of brushed it under the, under the way. And we was just like, nah, I think we, we good. We good. You know what I'm saying? And then another friend, another mutual, and these are two friends that we we trust very much with, with, with our music and our sound. So the other friend was like, yo, I was in the studio with Barker. Like, I think you guys should really get up. Like, he's a real good, cool dude. Like, he's got a lot of resources. Like, yo, you just, just tap in, just feel it out. And um, we went to go check Barker at a studio. And he was mad cool. Yeah. He was mad fucking cool, mad chill, just down to earth, no Hollywood shit, just like a cool, genuine guy. And, you know, getting to know more about him and learn about him, he knows the cool shit. He's, yeah, oh yeah. He knows the fucking cool shit. He's, he's dope. And from then on, we had already had an album in the tuck and we was just going to vibe on some new tunes to maybe put on the album. And through time, we just started going back, making more and more albums. Mind you, the first meeting, the first meeting, the first day we went to Barger Studio is when we made Suge Knight. That was what the song was originally called. We, we ran into some legal trouble. <laughs> or you're dealing with Suge Knight so uh, we, we had to switch that but that shit was called Suge Knight and uh, that was the first the first day within the first fucking 30 minutes we banged that shit out and from there on we was like yo we can make some shit like I fuck like I fuck with this vibe I fuck with this energy 
Like, this is good vibes right here. Let's continue to build on this, what we got going on. So from then on, we just start going back to the studio more. And that's when the, the pandemic hit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because while we was working with him, I think we we had one on tour with Corn, Alice in Chains. And then we did the Ghost Main tour. And by the time we got back from that, um, shit had hit the fan. So we had this, you know, this this weird time off, but we were still going to the studio, linking with Barker and, and making these tunes. You know what I'm saying? And it's always good to push each other in the studio. Cause like you said, what we're doing with Barker, he's not doing with anybody else. Yeah. And he's not, he's not making this certain type of music with anybody else. And uh, it's good for us to push him out his comfort zone and for us to push ourselves to make something that nobody's doing or has heard or has tried. So being in a studio with Barker, and it, it, it's definitely a good vibe and it, it just clicks because we all got ideas. I got an idea, I got a reference. OGM has something, Barker put his twist on it, you know? And a lot of the songs on a new album was started from scratch. You know what I'm saying? It's maybe like, it's a few in there that he already had cooked up and he thrown us like, yo, it's good. But even those, those got warped into something. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, but he's, he, he's so chill and so good in the studio. And yeah, what we're doing is nothing like he's doing with any of his other artists, you know? No, it's, it's cool, man. I think there, that that's where, you know, I think where you guys, are stoked because you strike that balance in him because he's definitely on one side going for like he wants to build like his own i think producing like empire you know which is yeah, dope yeah. he's taking all these young artists and bringing them under his wing and doing it like this on one side but then that's you know he's not a he's not a single lane dude you know what i mean yeah, like yeah. he 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 knows he knows all this old school shit he knows all this stuff and so you guys bring that out in him and that you know like you're saying you push him and and you get you know his you know his knowledge his music experience his production yeah. skills his everything yeah. uh and, and it's a really cool collaboration so i was really i was really hyped to hear those tracks because they sound really really fucking cool it's it's, it's good man and uh, you know it's it's growth and progression from ush you know it sounds yeah good. There's songs where we're trying some different vocals, you know, we're singing on these, you know, these got so it's just the whole, you know, evolution of what we are. And, uh, you know, me and OG and we joke around all the time, you know, we, some people, excuse me, some people going to look at this and be like, ah, man, they fucking, they, they selling out or they going to Barker to fucking try to do this, or is it going to be like what Barker does? And I'm like, bro, this is nothing of what you expected. Right? No, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's like people, people always trip on that shit, man. Like people used to always trip about, you know, like what label you were on or what this, what that. It's like when you have a band that is confident in their own identity and has a clear vision of what they want to do artistically, yeah. it doesn't fucking matter who they're working with or what label they're on or what, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. because it's all just influences, however they want it to influence what they do. You know what exactly. I mean? So exactly. Right on, man. I'm stoked for that. You keep talking about a new album. Is there a new full length coming? March 11th. March 11th. We got a, Woo! We got a the album is called Skin, and it's all produced by Travis Barker. And we got some good features on it. We got we got Saul Williams. Hell yeah. We got Bun B from UGK. Oh shit. We got <laughs> we got the young homie Jacia. And last but not least, we got Corey Taylor from Slipknot. What? Get out of here, dude. Yeah. And hell yeah. Sounding fucking massive that's why i'm so stoked on this new album because i'm just like yo we've been we've been working our fucking asses off we came up from the mud and this is like the official second horror lp and uh yeah it's all produced by travis barker and as you can see with the first few songs they're all different from each other just yeah. how all our songs are we got flavors for everything and yeah it's just very experimental 
And, um, you know, you got to push the needle, man. You got to be forward thinking. Like, yeah. I feel like everything else he, he he's doing with his other artists is in that one lane. And that, that's that's cool. I respect it. But, you know, we trying to up the game. We're trying to, you know, be a staple in, in music history of like, OK, this is what it is. Like I look back at that Nine Inch Nails Downward Spiral album and I'm just I still listen to it to this day. And I'm just like, this is a fucking game changer. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or I go back and I listen to that, those first few Mr. Bungle albums. And I'm just like, this is a game changer. What the fuck is this? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, March 11th, the album drops and it's dropping with another video. I can't say what it is. All right. All right. And, all right. And, uh, we start tour April 15th. Yeah. And, the Echoplex, right? Echoplex. And then we go from that tour right into the Slipknot tour. Ooh. So it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's some things coming up, you know? Yeah, man. That's awesome, dude. Congratulations, man. That's cool. I mean, you got, you know, you guys, like I said earlier, you know, clocking your trajectory since it started, you know, it's just been, yeah. Yep, it's been going yep. up, man. You guys have been growing and more and more people are hearing your music and you're touring like motherfuckers. So, uh, you know, super excited about the new record, man. And and obviously, you know, yeah, you got the skin tour coming out with No Face is opening, right? Yep, yep. That's the whole awesome. Nate No Face. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's blowing up too, man. He's yeah, he's fucking he's getting his shit fucking all I've over the him, place now. I've known him since MySpace, yo. He used to be in this group called Crime Kills, and it was like they labeled themselves like Game Boy Punk. And uh, <laughs> it was dope. You know, the production sound like synth punk, like uh, Screamers type shit. And he was yeah. just, just fucking going crazy over it. And then I remember coming to LA and we actually linked up and like shot the shit with each other. And uh, we, we've been boys since. Like that's that's family. You know what I'm saying? Like I done known him almost a decade. Awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah. Shout out to No Face and and yep. people can go get their tickets for that tour too. You can find it online, all that good shit. And the Slipknot, that's the that's the Knot Fest Roadshow, right? That's with uh that's oh Cypress Hills on that shit too, huh? Cypress oh, Hills. Oh fuck. Yeah, and and it's dope. It's dope because you know, a band like our caliber, where we're at and we're opening up for bigger bands, it can either go north or south. It can go west to east. It can go any kind of way. We've opened up for bigger bands, and sometimes it's been fucking brilliant. And then sometimes it's been not brilliant. You know what I'm saying? Like, we opened up for Avenged Sevenfold doing amphitheaters, and that crowd was fucking dead. They was looking at us like zombies. And um, we opened up for The Prodigy. That crowd was going nuts. You know what I'm saying? We opened up for Manson years back. That crowd was nuts. Um, we did Corn, Allison in Chains. That crowd was into it. So you just, you never know. But it's good that Slipknot is bringing out a legendary rap group so it can break up the monotony of uh, just another metal or aggressive music band. Because, you know, we got a few things in our tank. We can, we can hit you with the rap set. And we can hit you with this crazy punk metal set, whatever. But, you know, we smash it together. So it's just good to have Slipknot, Cypress Hill, and us. And it's only us three on that leg, which is good. Because normally when you do it, it's like, we're like first to four. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, people are still fucking finding their seats and grabbing yeah, beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you know how it is. Yeah, man. And um, it, it's just, it's dope, man. Like, we put this, we really put this into the air like years ago we was just talking about like damn man wish we could open up for Slipknot and you know all this shit and work with Corey and this shit came true man you just gotta put them vibes out and you know it'll boomerang back at you so that's gonna be a goodie man we we got a special set list for that we we trying to fucking wreck that shit yeah that's gonna be dope man and that's a cool the timing of that tour is dope too because uh, I, I did an interview with, with Jay Weinberg and it feels like Slipknot is in uh, just an awesome place right now as a band. Like, I feel like they're like really ready to like step back into touring again and, and doing all that shit. They got yeah. a new record coming out soon yeah. and Cypress Hill's got, 
the 30 year documentary like Esteban Oriole shit coming out like on Netflix. Esteban is the homie too, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, he's he's the fucking best, dude. He's the best. We've done a bunch of shit with him. So, you know, then you guys on your new album. So that tour is going to be it's going to be a fucking monster, man. That's going to be dope. It's going to be goody, man. It's, it's at the per- perfect time. And, you know, shout out to the dudes in Slipknot and Corey Taylor for, like, making that happen, man. Because, you know, real recognize real. Yeah, man. Awesome. Well, Yeti, I appreciate your time here on the Say the Jerry podcast, my man. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I do want to ask one last question. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming from your perspective as an artist, as a human being, uh, from Newark to Los Angeles. Uh, what do you think the meaning of life is? The meaning of life. I feel like life is not promised. Life is a thing that is short. We only going to be on these this earth but so many years if you do the right things, take care of your body, take care of your mind. And even then, things happen, shit happens. You just got to live life to the fullest, man. You got to, you got to hold no grudges. You got to always stay positive. No time for negativity because we can be here one day and then tomorrow you can be gone just like that. And, you know, I'm not a real religious guy. I'm more a spiritual guy. And yeah, yeah life throws you fucking loops man and you gotta live it to the fullest man and you gotta enjoy life and be kind to people and just take it for what it is because sometimes i think and i'm just like damn this life like one day i'm gonna die one day i'm gonna be 80 years old i'm gonna need help walking one day you know so you gotta you gotta live man and you gotta live positive so PMA to the end, man. That's that's all I got to say about the meaning of life. Right, right on, Yeti. I appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been really yes. cool talking to you. Yes, yes. Bless, man. Hope to catch you soon, man. I got to see you soon. Oh, you know? yeah, for sure. Well, I, I think I'll come out to the LA show. Say what's up. Yeah, yeah. Dope, yeah, dope. Yeah, 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 yeah. All through, man. We, we got special things for that one, too. So it's going to be a Hell good. Hell, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a good night. First night of tour, new record. Hell, yeah. Two years. Oh. Ooh, fucking a right yeah. on man appreciate your time yeti thank you brother yeah man peace peace bless bless oh yeah that's a wrap on episode 33 of the sailor jerry podcast as always huge amounts of gratitude and appreciation to our guest the one and only yeti bones yeti thank you very much for your time everybody go get that new horror record it's amazing uh go check them out on tour they are incredible headlining through april at a club near you and then of course they're going out with slipknot and cypress hill i mean come on that's a gig that is a gig ladies and gentlemen so uh shout out to horror shout out to yeti bones thank you very much for your time my man uh, you can follow Horror on Instagram. That's H O nine nine O nine. You can follow Yeti Bones on Instagram at Yeti Bones. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, you better be following Sailor Jerry. If you're not following Sailor Jerry, I am gonna get in so much trouble. So follow Sailor Jerry. Follow me at two one three Matt Man. And do not forget. That Sailor Jerry Spiced Rum is made the old school way. 92 proof, bold and smooth as hell. We will see you back in 14 days, ladies and gentlemen. Back on our regular rotation. Enjoy the weeks ahead. Peace.